of the group or organization is considered proved and shall not be questioned. Unquestionably, it would have been competent for the Charter to have declared flatly that membership in any of these named organizations is criminal and should be punished accordingly. If there had been such an enactment, it would not have been open to an individual who was being tried for membership to contend that the organization was not, in fact, criminal. But the framers of the Charter, acting last summer, at a time before the evidence which has been adduced here was even available to us, did not care to find organizations by fiat. They left that issue to determination after relevant facts were developed by adversary proceedings. Plainly, the individual is better off because of the procedure of the charter which leaves that finding of criminality to this body after hearings at which the organization must and the individual may be represented. It is at least the best assurance that we could devise that no mistake would be made in dealing with these organizations. Under the charter, <coughs> groups and organizations named in the indictment are not on trial in the conventional sense of that term. They are more nearly under investigation as they might be before a grand jury in Anglo-American practice. Article 9 recognizes a distinction between the declaration of a group or organization as criminal and the trial of any individual member thereof. The power of the tribunal to try is confined to persons, and the Charter does not expand that term by definition, as statutes sometimes do, to include other than natural persons. The groups or organizations named in the indictment were not as entities served with process. The tribunal is not empowered to impose any sentence upon them as entities. For example, it may not lay a fine upon them, even though they have property uh, of the organization, nor is it to convict any person because of membership. It is also to be observed that the Charter does not require subsequent proceedings against anyone. It provides only that the competent national authorities shall have the right to bring individuals to trial for membership therein. The Charter is silent as to the form that these subsequent trials should take. It was not deemed wise on the information then available that the Charter should regulate subsequent proceedings. Nor was it necessary to do so. There is a continuing legislative authority representing all four signatory nations competent to take over where the Charter leaves off. Legislative supplementation of the Charter, of course, would be necessary in any event to confer jurisdiction on local courts, to define their procedures, and to prescribe different penalties for different forms of activities. Fear has been expressed, however, that the Charter's silence as to future proceedings means that great numbers of members will be rounded up and automatically punished as a result of a declaration that an organization is criminal. It also has been suggested that this is or may be the consequence of Article 2, 1D of Control Council Act Number 10, which defines as a crime, quoting, membership in categories of a criminal group or organization declared criminal by the International Military Tribunal. A purpose to inflict punishment without a right of hearing cannot be spelled out of this charter and would be offensive to both its letter and its spirit. 
and I do not find in Control Council Act Number 10 any inconsistency with the Charter. Of course, to reach all individual members would require numerous hearings, but they will involve only narrow issues. Many persons will have no answers to charges if they're carefully prepared, and the proceedings should be expeditious, non-technical, and held in the locality where the person uh, accused resides. An incident, and incidentally may be conducted in two languages at most. <coughs> but I think it is clear that before any person is punishable for membership in a criminal organization, he is entitled to a hearing on the facts of his case. The Charter does not authorize the national authorities to punish membership without hearing. It gives them only the right to bring individuals to trial. That means what it says. A trial means there is something to try. The Charter denies only one of the possible defenses of an accused. He may not relitigate the question in a subsequent trial whether the organization itself was a criminal one. Nothing precludes him from denying that his participation was voluntary and proving that he acted under duress. He may prove that he was deceived or tricked into membership. He may show that he had withdrawn he may prove that his name on the rolls is a case of mistaken identity. The membership which the Charter and the Control Council Act make criminal, of course, implies a genuine membership involving the volition of the member. The act of affiliation with the organization must have been intentional and voluntary and it presents both statutory and juridical examples of declaring organizations to be criminal. Statutory examples are the German Criminal Code enacted in 1871. Section 128 was aimed against secret associations and 129 against organizations inimical to the, inimical to the state. A law of March 22, 1921, against paramilitary organizations. A law of July 1922, against organizations aimed at overthrowing the Constitution of the Reich. Section 128 of the Criminal Code of 1871 is especially pertinent. It reads, the participation in an organization the existence, constitution, or purposes of which are to be kept secret from the government, or in which obedience to unknown superiors, or unconditional obedience to known superiors is pledged, is punishable by imprisonment. It would be difficult to draw an act that would more definitely condemn the organizations with which we are dealing here than this German Criminal Code of 1871. I, rec I, I recall your attention that it condemns organizations in which obedience to unknown superiors or unconditional obedience to known superiors exactly the sort of danger and menace with which we deal here. Under the empire, various Polish national unions were the subject of criminal prosecutions. Under the Republic in 1927 and 8, judgments held criminal the entire Communist Party of Germany. In 1922 and 28, judgments of the courts ran against the political leadership core of the Communist Party, which included all of its so-called body of functionaries. This body of functionaries in that organization
time to review the evidence against each particular organization, which we take it should be reserved for summation after the evidence is all presented. But it is timely to say that the selection of the six organizations named in the indictment was not a matter of chance. The chief reasons they were chosen are these. Collectively, they were the ultimate repositories of all power in the Nazi regime. They were not only the most powerful, but the most vicious organizations in the regime. And they were organizations in which membership was generally voluntary. The Nazi leadership corps consisted of the directors and principal executors of the Nazi party. And the Nazi party was the force lying behind and dominating the whole German state. The Reich's cabinet was the facade through which the Nazi party translated its will into legislative, administrative, and executive acts. The two pillars on which the security of the regime rested were the armed forces, directed and controlled by the general staff and the high command, and the police forces, the Gestapo, the SA, the SD, and the SS. These organizations exemplify all of the evil forces of the Nazi regime. These organizations were also selected because, <coughs> while representative, they were not so large or extensive as to make it probable that innocent, passive, or indifferent Germans might be caught up in the same net with the guilty. State officialdom is represented, but not all the administrative officials or department heads or civil servants. Only the Reich's cabinet, the very heart of Nazidom within the government, is named. The armed forces are accused, but not the average soldier or officer, no matter how high ranking. Only the top policy makers, the general staff and the high command are named. The police forces are accused, but not every policeman, not the ordinary police which performed only the normal police functions. Only the most terroristic and repressive police elements, the Gestapo and the SD are named. The Nazi party is accused. But not every Nazi voter, not even every member, only the leaders, and not even every party official or worker is included. Only the bearers of sovereignty, in the metaphysical jargon of the party, who were the actual commanding officers and their staff officers on the highest levels. I think it's important that we, that we observe in reference to the Nazi party uh, just what it is that we are doing here and compare it with the denazification program in effect without any declaration of criminality in order to see in its true perspective the indictment which we bring against the Nazi party. Uh, some charts have been prepared. Uh, <coughs> First column, uh, column are the 79 million German citizens. We make no accusation against the citizenry of Germany. The next is the 48 million voters who at one time voted to put, or keep rather, the Nazi party in power. They voted uh, in response to the referendum. We make no charge against those who supported the Nazi party, although in some aspects of the denazification program, the supporters are included. Then comes the five million 
Nazi members, persons who definitely joined the Nazi party by an active affiliation, by an oath of fealty. But we don't attempt to reach that entire five million persons, although I have no hesitation in saying that there would be good grounds for doing so. But as a mere matter of the practicalities of this situation, it is not possible to reach all of those who are, are technically and perhaps morally well within the confines of this conspiracy. So the voters are disregarded. We don't accuse Nazi organizations which have some legitimate purpose, like welfare organizations. Only two of these party formations are named, the SA and the SS the oldest of the Nazi organizations, groups which had no purpose other than carrying out the Nazi schemes and which actively participated in every crime denounced by the Charter and furnished the manpower for most of the crimes which we proved. In administering preventive justice, with a view to forestalling repetition of these crimes against peace, crimes against humanity and war crimes, it would be a greater catastrophe to acquit these organizations than it would be to acquit the entire 22 individual defendants in the box. These defendants' power for harm is past. They're discredited men. That of these organizations goes on. These organizations are exonerated here. The German people will infer that they did no wrong, and they will easily be regimented in reconstituted organizations under new names behind the same program. In administering retributive justice, it would be possible to exonerate these organizations only by concluding that no crimes have been committed by the Nazi regime. For these organizations' sponsorship of every Nazi purpose and their confederation to execute every measure to attain these ends is beyond denial. A failure to condemn these organizations under the terms of the Charter can only mean that such Nazi ends and means cannot be considered criminal, and that the charter of the tribunal declaring them so is a nullity. I think my, I think my uh, colleagues uh, who have somewhat different aspects of the case to deal with would like to be heard on this subject. Yes.